Hi, it's nice to see you all again in Luxembourg. It's a beautiful day. I wanted to just point out one thing, and this is a comment that's off topic. People have been saying John Lambert, the attacker, always leaves a trace. It's actually Lacart's principle. Lacart was the father of modern forensic investigation. He was a French police detective back in like the 1820s. And it's actually the attacker always leaves something behind and takes something away. So I feel like we should give props to John or Lacart. Anyway, so I was a about 18 years old when Y2K happened. I wanted to be partying with my girlfriend and my, my dad worked in IT and he was really paranoid about what was going to happen for Y2K. So I was one of those kids who was sitting on a pile of bullets and beans at Y2K. I feel like it's useful to say that as a disclaimer that I have a bias because my personal experience was in the hysteria of Y2K. But there's a broader point I'm trying to make. If we go walk around Europe, we can find Roman roads that were built before Christ that people still use. Our contemporary technology stack is not built like that. So for those of you who are not as old as me, what happened in Y2K was programmers are lazy, and for many years people were like, we're just going to, also RAM is expensive, we're going to use you know, like two numbers instead of four numbers to represent the year. What can possibly go wrong? Time goes quickly. And there was a frantic amount of activity in the late 90s to kind of figure out where all we needed to touch code in systems so that we we're going to use four digits for a year so that it wasn't going to be 1900. <laughs> The fact is, the press made a big deal out of this in the years leading up to it. It was also during the technology boom when people started to smell money on the internet. So there was bias in the reporting. The fact is, if you ask a random person, they think Y2K was a dud, nothing happened. But actually, there are databases, academic databases of incidents, and there are records of the type of remediation that had to take place. There was a frantic amount of activity. Who here works in IT? Who here has noticed that like we don't get noticed when everything is going well, we're not really thanked when everything is going smoothly, and when the shit hits the fan, that's when we're responsible. Have you noticed that? So. There was an awful lot of unsung heroes who made Y2K be a relative dud. But like around 2012, I started using this idea in conference talks of Threat Landscape, 20, Threat Landscape 2038 because I kept seeing cybercrime going up and to the right and up and to the right and up and to the right. So for me, it was a useful mental experiment to say like, everybody's saying Threat Landscape 2025. But what's Threat scan Landscape 2038 look like? Because it's not going to look like this trend line continuing up, right? Because at some point, cybercrime is consuming 100% of GDP, and that's not going to happen. So whatever 2038 looks like, it's different than today. And so it was kind of a just a straw man that I used in talks. And then all of a sudden, I realized that we're basically getting closer to that than to the 2008 financial crisis. And I always figured that you know, like, we averted a catastrophe before that we would do it again. But if we take a pause for a second and just think, has everybody here written a hello world or some kind of print statement or something? You've written some code. So if you put on your thinking cap and you say, what could go wrong if Mr. Computer started thinking it was the wrong year? Just with common sense, you can say it would be things like shipping, logistics, travel, hospitality, events, stuff like that. Nobody's pacemaker stopped working because it was the wrong year, right? You have a different order of things that fail at that granularity, and things did fail. But what's going to happen in 2038, sometime in mid-February, is that the Unix epoch, which began on the 1st of January 1970, is going to flip. And in some non-trivial amount of fielded equipment, like if you go out and you find the nearest stoplight, you know, traffic light, it has a state machine, it's red, yellow, green, right? And it has a timing circuit. It's cheap. The thing that's put in the ground was the least compliant bid because that's how we procure stuff. Does that controller have a problem with an integer overflow? And what happens to the state machine of that device? 
when it overflows and it thinks it's 1901, when the system clock, like depending on the logic behind it, you could have some very unpredictable and potentially cascading effects hitting. And what I've noticed is over the years of talking about this as a halfway joke, I've been waiting for somebody to come up to me and be like, yeah, no, there's a group over here that's worked in, on that and they've solved this problem and nobody's doing that. So I'm standing up here slightly nervous because I don't know very much about this, but I know that it looks like we're driving toward a slightly bigger problem. And it, it seems irrelevant to talk about 2038 right now because you know, we hope that the bomb doesn't go off. We hope we make it to 2026, right? But time is going by quickly, and we're talking about the CRA, and we're talking about doing secure by design. We're talking about the failure of the network edge, but we have a broader problem, which is that between now and 2038, we're going to have to do something. We're going to have to dig up a statistically significant sample of fielded devices and see, does it fall over in a lab? And what do we need to do and that's not happening, and so I am concerned, and so you can talk to me afterward. Thank you very much. And the last... important thing, because a lot of the electronics are going to be sourced from a small, relatively small island in Asia, and so it's a logistical choke point. Thanks, Trey.